My name is Adrienne C. Smith, and I welcome you to our 5 o'clock panel. As many of you know, my day job is I am the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Fleischman Hillard. So now the truth is out. I have a day job, and then this is my passion project. So again, I am the Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer at Fleischman Hillard, and I'm super excited to be able to introduce this panel. And what's important to me about this panel is it shows the value of DEI and how DEI is more than what we commonly think about when we talk about race and gender and sexuality and belonging. This taps into aging. That's a next crisis that we always talk about and making people feel like they belong at any age. One of the things at Fleischman Hiller that we always talk about, and which is one of the reasons I am so attracted and super excited about working for Fleischman Hiller is, we know that DEI is a part of the essential business of any organization. So much so that Fleischman Hiller has a business division of DEI, which we call True Mosaic, and we make sure that each of our clients have access to business strategies and opportunities so that they can make sure their organizations are solid when it comes to the human connection business. So if you take a moment to check out our website and go to True Mosaic in one of our drop down talents that talks about the business of DEI, that's part of the part of the work that I'm so super excited about when it comes to the business of DEI. So I'm super excited right now to introduce the panel that's coming up and we will have a conversation about creativity has no age limit, so please give a round of applause to Colleen, Kimfer, Angela, Karen, and Shanae. Well, thank you, Adrian, for having us here at Inkwell Beach. It's an incredible honor, and we're so delighted to be here today to talk about something that can be so taboo, yet it is something that every single person in this room, on this beach, in all of Cannes has in common, and that is age. We all have a number. Yeah. We all age, right? We it's do, true. we do. We all have a number, and if we're lucky enough, it gets bigger every year, <laughs> right? My number is 51, and I'm really proud about that. I call it out and I own it, because if I didn't, I would really be shrinking away from the experiences and the stories that make up who my identity is. So I know we talk a lot about identity on this stage this week and how our identities shape our creativity. Yet when it came to age, and we were looking at this, and Adrian alluded to this in DEI strategies, only 8% of organizations include age as part of their DEI strategy. So, as Adrienne mentioned, as an Earn First Creative Agency at Fleischmann Hillard, we really wanted to unpack why is this a missing piece of the puzzle in DEI strategies. So, as Adrienne mentioned, we have these four beautiful, incredible women that have joined us on the stage, and I do want to introduce them a little bit more so you know a little bit about their background. Kimber. Hello. <laughs> so, Kimber is a brain based leadership coach who is passionate about DEI and social justice and the founder of Inclusion Equals. She has this really lovely equation. It is idea. Inclusion equals diversity plus equity plus accessibility. Kimfer is also a former creative, executive creative director and she's really passionate about coaching leaders in building cultures from the inside out. Not only is she here on this incredible stage, but she's been on the same stage with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the World Economic Forum. So welcome, Kim Fur. Thank, Thank you, for you here. so much. I'm so happy to be here and with these lovely ladies that are here with me as well. Thank you. And then we have Angela Guidry. Angela has her own cheering section. Angela is, was chosen this year as a Can Can Diversity Collective 50 plus age ambassador. So she's the very first one. Beyond that, she's an incredible, inspiring leader who works at TMA. And in all the free time I'm sure you don't have, you're also a yogi, a, re a re Reiki practitioner, and a certified meditation and visualization instructor. So welcome to the stage, Angela. And my number is 58. Ooh. 
own it. I love it. <laughs> then we have, oh, I have my cards out of order here. Karen Blanchard, <laughs> Blanchard right down there. If Karen looks familiar, she's also known as Karen the Brit Chick. And she has quite um, a following and a wonderful YouTube presence on Instagram, on TikTok. And as you can tell from her fashionable looks right on the stage here, she um, is a regular at Fashion Weeks across the world. She's been featured in Harper's Bazaar, Elle, The New York Times, to name just a few. So we're so happy to have you here. Oh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you. And then we have Shanae Ingleton Smith joining us at the end there. If you don't know um, Shanae, you should because she is an incredible founder of um, the agency Kensington Gray. And what Kensington Gray is, it's an influencer management agency that represents over a hundred of the most powerful black and brown voices in the industry. Welcome to the stage. So I wanted to start by asking, we all know identity isn't fixed, right? It changes from day to day. And for some of us, when we think about aging, it's like, yeah, I'm gonna do this gracefully. Or some people really step into it with confidence. And maybe other people don't have that same experience. So I just wanted to start by asking each one of you, um, what is your personal relationship to aging? And how does it intersect with other aspects of your identity? Ooh, right off the bat, Colleen, <laughs> with a good one. Okay, um, I think I'm just starting just because I'm uh, at the end over here. Um, so for me, my number is 50, going on 51 this year. And thank you, thank you. Um, you know, I think for me with age has been really interesting because, because of the fact that partly of my heritage and part of it is just the youthful look that I've had for so long that all through my 30s and even through my 40s, I had to work really hard to look my age, if that makes sense. Because at certain point, when you look too young, then you're not taken seriously, right? Yeah. Right. And so then I'm like trying to look older or whatever that might be to showcase like, no, I'm actually, you know, not 20 when I'm 38, right? So uh, I think for me at that point was happening. Now that I'm, I've gone around the bend, no one is mistaking me to be a 20 year old, by the way. Uh, no one's gonna be like, ooh, Kimper over there, she's Gen Z, right? No, they're not doing that. Um, and so for me now is I think sort of embracing and um, understanding like, the knowledge, hopefully, and the wisdom that came with the age and less concerned about it, but at the same time, kind of drop the age bomb yeah. from time to time. Do you feel like you can be more authentic, not having to pretend to try and appear older? Yes, for sure. And also part of it is like, at a certain point, we oh, don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? Like, uh, like I'm me, I'm me. And that's where we're at, yeah. Thank you. Angela, you want to go tell us a little bit about you and um, your identity as it comes to aging? Um, so I don't look at it as aging. You know, it, it's me. Uh, and I've been this way all my life. Youthful, you know, present, not afraid. Uh, so I didn't look at being 58 as this number that just progresses up. Um, I do kind of say that I'm on the back end of my century, but, <laughs> but you know, that's just a joke for me. I, I am enjoying yeah. the back end of my century. I enjoy the front end, and I'm going to enjoy the back end just as I did the first, you know, 50 years of my life. So I hit 50, and I was like, nothing changed. Right, like they my aha moment came when I was 25. So no, nothing changed. I just kind of got progressive in the things that I'm doing. You know, my daughters are, I have two daughters. They're grown and growner is what I call them. They are adulting well, um, and we constantly stay in contact. Anytime I meet young people, um, you know, the wisdom comes out. But that wisdom was in my head when I was 25. It's just gotten better. Um, D during the course of the years that I've, you know, grown up, grown up, right? I'm now grown up, um, and it, and it's gotten wiser. Uh, so the language has changed a little bit, right? Yeah. 
and the spirit of, of what I'm doing uh, with my words has changed a lot. So that's it. I love that you talked about when you turned 50, like there was no big aha, uh -huh, because I think we all have these milestone birthdays. It could be your 30th birthday. It could be your 40th birthday. Any one of them. And we have like build up all this angst and anticipation about what that's going to be. When really it's a continuum, right? Like it's not like you wake up one day and everything's different. Okay, so I think for me, and I, I agree 100% everything you just said. And first of all, she has the most beautiful eyes I've ever seen. You have, afterwards, have a look at her face close up. Um, I think for me, as I was saying to um, earlier today, that I've never seen age as something to what I'm defined by first. Um, and especially in my business, which is predominantly the fashion space and some, somewhat the beauty space, um, I've never come with that as my f leading um, pillar to define who I am because I've never believed in putting myself into a box. Um, and that goes through to age and to fashion and to everything else in my life. Because um, I've always thought that once, I feel like people, and this is generalizing, um, there is, there tends to be a labeling mm -hmm. on you, and this is society, let's put it that way. And I've always thought that that's always been so wrong and so limiting for women and for men. Um, and, you know, for example, um, we may talk about this later, but I'll just touch on it quickly now. You know when you always see those fashion articles and it says, um, how to dress in your 30s, how to dress in your 40s, how to dress, you know what I mean, those. I think they're the most patronizing, <laughs> insulting, backward, archaic things that exist. And I, there's very few women or less and less women who identify with those terms. And I am one of them. And I just think that why can't we just move away from that and just define ourselves by who we are as a person and what, how we like to show up yeah. and just take that out of it. What I love so much about your content, um, when <laughs> <laughs> what I love so much about your content is that when you go out on the street and you encounter people and you ask them about their fashion or what they're wearing, yes. you have such a universal range yes. of people that you approach and yes. all who have incredible own individual looks and yes. styles. Yes. And it really has nothing to do with what age group or, you know, it's, it's really beautiful. Um, thank you and I'm glad you said that. And the reason why I started that series was because I didn't at the time see on YouTube a series, it's, it's called What Everyone Is Wearing in New York, but I didn't see a series like that created, so I created it. Um, and because I found that a lot of the, even during Fashion Week, a lot of the street style photographers um, or just the definition of fashion as a whole has a romance with youth. And that trickles through into street style as well. And to me, regardless of your age, style is style is style. And so the common thread that runs through my series when I stop people and say, oh my God, where did you get that dress? Or where did you get that, those earrings? I love her earrings, by the way. Um, <laughs> yours. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> so I, I don't care what age you are, what race you are, what gender you are, whatever pronouns you go by, uh, nothing. The common thread is your style. That's the common thread throughout all of them. And that's, to me, is what true style is. It's, it's literally ageless. Yeah. That's it. It's beautiful. Shanae, yes. all the way down there. Um, so I also um, echo Karen's sentiments. I think that for me, it's about checking your biases in every aspect. And I think that this goes both ways. I find myself doing this with younger people because, you know, we have a team of people who skews a little bit, you know, on the Gen Z side of things. And we also have people, you know, Gen X that work for us. We have people that are very young, Gen Z on our roster, as well as um, some gorgeous silver baddies, silver haired baddies, what we like to call them. But I think it's just about eliminating biases and, and looking at people for who they are and, and, and understanding and empowering people to be the best they can be regardless of their age and not allowing that, not letting that limit you. Um, you know, there are things, it's never too late in life. Like one of my um, 
icons that I look up to is Kris Jenner. She's like the momager um, extraordinaire. She didn't start doing what she was doing until she was 50. And I think that if you, you know, she looked at age or felt like she was defined um, by age, she might think, oh, I'm too old to start or I'm too old to do this or I'm too old to do that. And like, she's one of like the baddest managers in the game. So I feel like you can do anything at any age, literally. And I think that it's, it's important for all of us to check our biases and to just look at people for who they are and their and their potential and uh, yeah, not be defined by that and lean into that as opposed to your age, which I truly believe is nothing but a number. Now I'm thinking what career is my next career? I'm a year behind. Well, <laughs> There are so many entrepreneurs. I think there's like this meme, uh, I think it's on Instagram or maybe on TikTok where it says, you know, this person was this age when they started this. This yeah. person was that age and you had no idea. And these are people who have done incredible things that have literally changed the world. So don't let where you're at in life or how old you are Im impact your belief in it's yourself. It's not too late. It, it's never too late to do anything. And it's also never too early. Again, I think it goes both, both ways. And I find myself, you know, sometimes judging people that are younger. So I, I think that we, it's so important for us to just, yeah, not let age define how you look at somebody or um, how you view their potential. And shout out to Adrian for opening up this year to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I love it. Oh, it's been a long career journey. And um, do understand it wasn't a competition. We just, you know, we submitted and I was chosen. And I appreciate her choosing me. So oh. it's been hard. It's been hard. As we age, it gets worse. I'm sorry. I done took over the stage. I'm sorry. Please, please <laughs> no, do. No, but as we, as we age, it, it gets worse if we haven't you know, been a part of the 30 under 30 list or 40 under 40, you know what I'm saying, like all these lists out here that people strive for. And I'm not saying yeah. don't strive for that. I'm saying it's okay if you don't because you can still get to can or you can still get to wherever else. I'm sorry, my voice. Like, yeah, well just, like you can get places uh, and to still be recognized. Um, if you're not a part of these lists or awards or things like that, you can still, I'm on a panel for the first time in our industry sitting up here because of this. So. Thank you for sharing I should have brought that. tissue, I'm sorry. I oh, have some, I brought some. I'm a Pisces, like, I'm sorry. <laughs> Me too, <laughs> Me too. I was gonna guess that. <laughs> um, I think, I, I'm gonna say too, it's my first time at Cannes, and I've worked in this industry for 29 years, and I'm just so happy to be here. So, yes, things always continue to happen and build and grow. Yeah, we can just pass them around as the, yeah, we'll just keep them right there. Okay, so um, this is actually a great um, segue to this next question. For the first time, uh, I think in history, there's five generations in the workforce. So we have the silent generation, we have boomers, we have Gen X, we have millennials, and we have Gen Z. And that's a lot of different personalities, generations, all in one place. And that can be really powerful if you can leverage everyone's strengths. Um, so I'm curious um, to hear, especially Kim, for your perspective, as you help build teams in leadership and coaching, how do you think we can get to positive places like that versus um, a, an adversarial, like, boomer, zoomer conversation? Uh, I think that's a really great question, right? Because we love anything that can pit against, because, you know, it, mm. it sells, it does all of that, right? So we love to see all of that on social media or whatnot, but honestly, um, creating a really deep and understanding culture means that you have to have thoughtful approach, you have to have empathy, compassion, right? Um, and all of that to make it work. So I think in scenarios like this, so I work uh, with a client where they're an agency, they realize that they're mostly white, mostly young, working with a really big brand, and they had enough um, mind to know we are gonna have so much roadblocks because we don't have enough perspective right. that they built into their campaign process to bring in yeah. 
a panel of DEI individuals, marketers who are older, yeah. um, so that they can bring in experiences to have them bounce off ideas as they're building the brand. I thought, that is amazing. So do they hire these individuals to be on staff, or this is simple, like a sounding board? Yeah, simple sounding board, definitely paid for their yeah. time, and they try to keep it as, um, as you know, like not as intrusive to their um, to their to their work process as well. But knowing that it was so important to get all of that feedback from age to when we talk about other parts of diversity, um, to make sure that they're also doing the right thing for their clients. And and I just thought that was incredible because oftentimes people don't because there, there is too much of a... They had the self-awareness. Yeah, to, to even go that far, to have that kind of um, perception. And so for me, whenever I work with clients, those are the ways that we talk about things. Is like, here is your intersection. So we'll go through an intersection exercise. And then we'll look at it from their individuals to their teams. Yeah. And then we look at where are the gaps. And if you have gaps there, who are you going where are you going to fill those gaps of information? And so that's how we look at in various stages. And I think that you're bringing up the very um, statistic brought to life, right? That only 8% have it as part of their DEI strategy. But once you have that awareness and you can map it out, I love that. Yeah. And interesting enough, um, older age, and you know, for women, it's actually almost like 45 and older, which is... BS, but older and younger are actually on, on the marginal wheel. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Shanae, I would love to hear some more from you on the intergenerational, knowing that you bring in influencers of all ages, and how do they ever interact, or how do they leverage each other's expertise and talents to learn? So on the influencer side, it's very unique in that I find that influencers fall into like a psychography, like they have a, a similar um, way of thinking. So <clears throat> our older influencers, our younger influencers, they actually all like get along with each other and like vibe because they have that common thread that b brings them all together. However, um, as a founder, and we have a team of 45 people, and um, we, I would say that we definitely skew Gen Z, but we have Gen Z um, team members, we have millennial team members, we have Gen X team, team members, no boomers, but um, what we've learned um, is that we have to, there's things that we can learn from each other. So one of the things that um, I had to learn as a founder, so I came up in the generation where um, I started my career working for boomers. So it was like, if your boss called you at 2 a.m., you pick up that phone and you like, <laughs> yes, you know, you do. At, at your service, you know, sir, ma'am, um, or else you might get fired. Whereas uh, that mentality just doesn't exist in, you know, with, the, with Gen Zs. Um, it was like, if you were the first person to leave the office, it was like, how dare you? <laughs> Whereas, um, you know, Gen Z, our Gen Z team members are very big on boundaries, very big on, you you know, I work from the hours of nine to five. Don't call me on the weekend. I'm enforcing boundaries with our clients. Um, and in the beginning, we were like, what the hell is wrong with these young people that work for us? Like, do, do they want to work here? Um, but then we realized, you know, that we can learn something from them too. And that um, it, you, you are more productive when you take time for yourself, when you log off, when you take time to recharge, when you prioritize your mental health. And conversely, there's things that some of our younger team members also learn from us as people who have been in the workforce for 20 years. So I think that it's that mutual respect and, and, and empathy, learning from each other, not it's not necessarily that there's a right or there's a wrong, but leveling the playing field considering everybody's opinions and perspectives and experiences as equal and finding what works best for you. And, um, you know, for example, as a team, we've enforced, you know, we work from the hours of nine to five. And at first I was so scared to enforce that. Like we're gonna lose yeah. all of our clients. Like this is like the worst thing ever, but we find our team is more productive. And because we respect their boundaries and we have you know, we work, we have the rule of, we work from the hours of nine to five. We find that our team members 
actually work harder and even work more because they know that they have the option not to if they don't want to. But when you, you know, have an environment where it's like you have to do this or you have to do that, they're, they push back on that. So I think, yeah, taking an exercise in empathy, seeing other people's perspectives and realizing that you can eat, both sides can learn from each other. Uh, you can, you can, go so much further and, and, and learn so much. Yeah. I, I've definitely experienced like the Gen Z not being able to reach, but it's, there is something to be said. It's like for me to like learn the boundaries, right? Like to respect other people's boundaries on their time, but also like maybe hold the mirror up to myself and like, man, yeah, maybe I should log off too, right? <laughs> like I could learn something from this. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna say the quiet part out loud, really loud. Um, there is age ceilings in creative industries. I think we can nod our heads at that in this room. Um, and often there's this word that's been thrown around, two words lately, um, that younger creatives are often perceived as more culturally relevant. And that's become code word for age. And I was like, wow, that's, that's interesting. So does that mean I'm not culturally relevant anymore? because I'm 51, I, I don't know. So I would love to hear, um, Angela or Karen, like why do you think there's this culture of, like this idea of being culturally relevant is just a young thing? Like why do you think that's reinforced? Honestly, I think, well first of all, that's just a crock of shite. So, <laughs> I love it. And it's coming from, not, I'm not saying you, I'm not, not shooting <laughs> the messenger, but Honestly, that's coming, in my opinion, to answer that question directly, it's coming from a place of uh, redefining what is considered aspirational, mm. okay? So, because what in most Western societies considered as aspirational is, is anything south of 25 years old, probably, give or take. Men too, actually. Um, I, as I've said before, I come from the fashion space, so it, it is sharply defined that way. It's very, very niche, and it's very, very narrow, and it's been that way historically. Um, and I've always thought that it's such a load of BS because you, there are so many opportunities, and there are not only opportunities, that's the wrong word, because it almost takes like a charity case, but there is so much loss that I see happening when you are, um, say designers, for example, or people in my industry are ignoring um, and idolizing people who are much younger than us, for example. Yep. Um, and I think that there is so much untapped potential that is really just waiting to be just taken. Um, I'm starting to see slow examples of it, and I'll, talk, I'll answer those examples in the next question. But um, I think of like uh, other societies outside of the Western societies, and they actually flip it, and they idolize the older generation. Um, and it's not seen as a charitable thing. I mean, it is truly aspirational. Yeah. Um, and I think we are the ones who, because of that, there is this inherent fear, I think, of uh, just getting older because of that. Yeah, we need to flip the narrative on all of this, yeah. right? Like, do you mind, so it, I really um, resonated with that, right, Karen? It's because in the Korean um, culture, mm -hmm. Age is a huge thing, but because age is literally when you meet someone, your name, but you're also like expressing your age, so you know how you can speak to them. So there's levels of ways respect. that respect, yeah. There's level of respect in which you provide to the older generation, and it comes down even to months. Really? Yes. And so I think that's the thing is that we have such a Western culture embedded in like in so much that we don't always think to look at other yeah. cultures, Eastern culture, you know, global south, all of that stuff in which really has a different perspective than what we're used to here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to blame it on our clients. <laughs> I'm going to blame it on our clients. Um, I don't want to use the word obsession, but I get it. We have a new generation of money makers out there. Um, but I wear Adidas, and I don't see myself in an ad, you know? 
I think it was Whoopi Goldberg who tried to do a generational ad with one of the shoe companies, and they um, rejected it. Wow. And I thought that was just the craziest thing on earth. I'm like, why wouldn't you show a generational uh, loyalty to your brand? Yes. So I blame it on our clients. I have clients, I, um, their target, 18 to 24. Yep. And I have to stay in that box. Yeah. Um, and they're old farts. They are. My clients are old farts. They don't know <laughs> yes. anything about anything. And every time we talk about data, because mm -hmm. you know that's a great story, but show me the data, right? So every time we talk about data, they go, well, my son, who's 16 and in high school, yes. <laughs> and we're like, that is a um, story of one. Like, that is not a data set. So I blame it on our clients. They are definitely obsessed with our younger generations, from the younger, younger millennials to the Gen Zers, and, and they're tapping into Gen Alpha, right? Um, I also blame us for not steering creative ideas that involve mm. culturally relevant ages. Yes. This panel, I blame us for not driving that conversation. So we, we have to do better for us. Yeah, it's so hard when you have clients come to the table with those requests yes. because you know something can be richer. You can know that there's a bigger story that can be told, or you know that they could be a disruptor if they leaned into something that was different instead of doing just what's we out have, there more of it. We have disrupting influencers who are my age. So why wouldn't we um, do better in our industry and say, hey client, I got it, you wanna get after this money. But those are the same kids still living at home, so guess who you still have to talk to? <laughs> the parents. I mean, think about the makeup industry right now, yes. right? Um, obviously, there's the whole, like, we gotta be youthful, everything's good, but there's a whole slew of influencers and a whole slew of brands coming out with makeup for our age group where we are highlighting our age versus trying to hide I it wear and Fenty. youth it, you know? And, and I love that. What did you say? And I wear Fenty. Oh, Fenty. Yeah. She doesn't have age in that. Fenty. Yeah. Rariana. Okay. <laughs> Angela, was it you who had said um, in some of our previous conversations, like, show me the makeup on my skin. Show that it actually works to do something on me. But, yeah. But my skin isn't old. No. You know, my skin has textures and things that need to be smoothed out. But I know 15-year-olds that have skin that need to be smoothed out. So it's not old. Yeah. It's not old. Wow. Wow. Well, the thing is, you can't see, how can you see what a uh, foundation looks like when they show it on somebody who's like 18 years old? Or, I mean, how are we supposed to, and you're supposed to say, oh, it smooths and blurs. What's it smoothing and blurring? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a 14-year-old daughter who likes to do my makeup, and she's always trying to smooth and blur. <laughs> and yeah, they're putting, like tons of concealer, and like there's I'm nothing good. there. I'm good with the wrinkles. It's all good. <laughs> But an 18-year-old can't tell us how to smooth. Right. No, absolutely. Yes. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go specifically to women in the workplace, also partly because all, obviously, all of us up here on the stage are women. And, um, you know, according to Harvard Business Re Review, age discrimination can impact women in particular at every stage of their careers. Lucky us. From what you mentioned first, undermining your seniority when you're first starting out, to, of course, making babies, right? Like, men can't make the babies, so someone's gotta do it if you wanna have kids. And They can't make the babies, they're just not carrying the babies. Right, yes, yes, yes they can make them. <laughs> Very good point. Um, so, I'm just curious, like, it seems really unfair that, like, at all these different steps and age, even when we're younger, they become hurdles within our working industry, and how do we get beyond that? So I'm curious, Sinead, to hear some from how you think we can be better allies and really create these support systems for women at different stages of their career. I think, uh, again, it's empathy, understanding, 
um, and making concessions and accommodations when necessary, but again, not defining people by their age and empowering them to you know, be who it is that they wanna be. Also challenging the status quo. Um, I think that a lot of like the superstars and, and um, icons out there are people who are older. Like Anna Wintour is still at the helm of Vogue and that's yeah. one of the most culturally relevant uh, publications out there. Um, again, we have Kris Jenner, we have Mae Musk, who is a model and she's well into her 80s. And if you look at the people in her comments and the people that are um, following her and cheering her on and look at her as an icon and an inspiration, it's a lot of younger people. So I think that, you know, there's something that can be uh, learned from everyone. Now, in terms of how we can support them from a career perspective uh, and in the different stages is ensuring that you are finding paths, using tools and resources that ensure that you are reaching and sourcing and recruiting people from all age groups, from all backgrounds. Um, and it goes this, and this applies to every intersection of diversity, um, but that should also include age. So maybe it's having older people on your board. Maybe it's, you know, including uh, people that are older at your round table, including different women from different perspectives and at different stages in their life uh, on your team in various capacities. But just opening up your mind to the idea that ideas co-workers, your team, it shouldn't be homogenous, and there are things to learn when you don't focus on creating an echo chamber in your, you know, in your workplaces and in, in your daily lives, and opening yourself up to just, you know, different perspectives, different voices, different, and different backgrounds. I agree, and I thank you for that. And as someone who is a mom to three kids, like, it's definitely trying to create that space for women at those different points in their career. One, and I have to say, like, one big, for me, when I um, had three kids, I worked at an agency and I was able to go to a three-day work week. And sometimes you just have to ask for what you need. The worst thing somebody can say is no, and the best they can say is yes. So, big proponent of that. Okay, so we've had babies, so now we're gonna go through menopause. Um, <laughs> by next year, over a billion people globally are gonna be in menopause. That's B, billion. And one in 12 women actually resign from their jobs during menopause due to symptoms. So yeah, we all know, we talk about a lot of the negative side effects, right? Brain fog, hot flashes, anxiety, it goes on and on and on. But one of the most interesting positive side effects is enhanced creativity, which I found so interesting. So I think that this like opens up a door to have a different kind of conversation about how we can support women at these different stages. So I'm curious, you know, has it ever been something that you had an organization come to you, Kimfer, and asked you to build that into their strategy for their workplace? And, and is, that, is it popping up yet for you in, conver in conversations? Are they bringing it up? No. no. Okay. No, no, unless um, there is a older woman at the helm of the organization and even for them, sometimes they they are careful, right? Yeah. Of their position, power, and trying. So it's, it gets really complicated when it comes to menopause. And first of all, uh, for those of you, um, it's not even talked about even amongst people going through menopause. Like that's the hard part, right? Yeah. So until you're in it, I had no idea there was three stages to menopause. <laughs> Did you know that? I'm in phase one, and I've been in it for five years now, okay? That's a very long five. time. Five. And then the shortest part of your menopause is the menopause. There's perimenopausal, there's menopause, and then after that, which is lasts for 12 months, if you, you know, sorry about the TMI, everyone, but if you don't have a period for 12 months, that's when you know you officially had your menopause. And then after that, you're in forever post-menopause forever in postmenopause, And these are things that women don't even talk about at all. Not only to, I mean, younger generations, are we even talking about that with you? Probably not. Even with our own generation, we're not talking about it. Yeah. And so how are we even talking about it from a 
uh, work environment? How do we make accommodations for that when we're not even talking about it ourselves or asking for accommodations because we're uh, whatever, maybe it's shame or whatever it is that is keeping us from talking about it. So yeah. it makes it really hard to flip that. Our organization um, has started to have menopause support this year, and it's more informational webinars and those types of things. Um, but it, I was like, I gotta go to this, you know, like I'm 51, <laughs> like I'm in this. And um, it was a, a, like a big like moment to be like, oh, sorry guys, I gotta join the menopause webinar right now, right? Like that took some courage to say those words out loud. And people are like, oh, oh, okay. Like, but I think it's just, nobody talks about it. So the more you talk about something, um, it will definitely, hopefully, become. I love that the some of the women stars, movie stars, yeah. TV stars are starting to talk about it, you know, and I think that will help destigmatize some of this because you have very like popular social, you know, people that are influencers that are talking about it, like Holly Berry, she's talking about it, yeah, right, and so. I think we need more of that yes. to again destigmatize these yes. scenarios because. We, like I said, we can't get it into um, a program within your organization if we're not even talking about it, let alone ask for what are the programmatic changes, what are the policy changes can we do to accommodate? Yeah, thank I, you for I that. I think we're in a crawl, walk, run stage of it. Yeah. And, and it's unfortunate because, fortunately, unfortunately, because uh, organizations are they're now creating like ERGs that are 50 plus, yeah. um, but they're all inclusive, of course. So that means that you know men are in that. But we st so there's not even a space there for us to even talk <laughs> about it. But ideally, I'm hoping that I'm very hopeful that our younger generations, you all are very vocal. Be vocal about that, ladies. Like start talking about it. It's going to take an ERG and then somebody say, oh, we need to probably put this in HR. And then somebody say, that's not where it belongs. It belongs up in a part of our culture. Yep. Um, but that's a long way from there and I'll be retired. So, but ideally, Maybe we'll we be need your to second start career talking. to help socialize that, <laughs> Angela. Um, we do need to start talking about it. Uh, we talk about everything else that's emerging yep. in medical, you know, from, you know, ADHD to, I can't remember the name of the new, the newest one I heard. It's probably old to everybody else, but the, there's some, another one that has to do with attention spans. Like, we talk about all of that, but we don't talk about our 50 plus folks and what we're going through. Um, so I think it, it, we need to treat it the way we treat all the other conditions, uh, yes. even though it's not a condition, people, it's not a condition. Not it, a is condition. A, is, it is a way of life. Thank you for that. So now that we've gone through menopause, <laughs> There, there was a lot, the next stage where I do think it gets difficult for people is when they start to be caregivers for their loved ones, right, and for their parents. And um, we have done some research about this recently, giving care to caregivers. And what's interesting about it is like, how can now we support people in the workplace when they have to step out of that space to then do that for the ones that they love? Um, so this is really about how do you build an inclusive team from the inside out? How do you help people um, with these caring responsibilities not just survive, but thrive um, creatively at work? Anybody want to take that one? I would say just similar to how we support, um, you know, families that are having babies, you know, caregiver leave I know is something that is available through different benefit programs, um, but also to being an empathetic and understanding employer, um, having open lines of communication and having and making it your team members feel safe to come to you with different challenges that they're facing in their life so that you can personally accommodate them. I think that everyone's understanding of that for the most part um, at KG, but I do think that a lot of workplaces have a long way to come with that. Um, but just being open and understanding to that and empathetic to that. Uh, so yeah, building in programs and or benefits that support people going through that and not just the from a time off or flex perspective but the mental health and the mental health like just the mental burden of yes of, of being a caregiver to you know a parent and 
what that does to you emotionally and, and mentally and, and the toll that that takes and being supportive and understanding of that. Thank you for that. Yeah, no, I completely agree with what Sinead just said. I know a friend of mine who's going through it at the moment and she's looking after her mom. And um, I know how much of a toll it's taking on her. And she knows it too, because she tells me. And, um, you know, it's, it's very, very hard. And she's not, she's not a professional in that area. That's her mom, <laughs> you know, and she's the daughter. So it's really difficult because there's guilt wrapped around it as well. Because she needs to, I keep telling her, you need to carve out time for yourself and your own life. Because, you know what I mean? Because you have to have, you've got to be strong well, yourself yeah. and have your life versus just having it just all with one person only. So, what's that balance? It's very difficult to care for someone if you don't care for yourself first. Correct, yes, yeah. that's it. Yeah. yeah. I want to switch a little bit to talk about how age is portrayed in the media. And um, we work with W, W, Dub, double A-R-P, A-R-R-P, I don't know why I can't say that. I have gotten an invitation in the mail to join when I turned 50, so maybe that was my milestone invitation. <laughs> um, and they have found out that although 46% of U.S. adults are age 50 or older, raising my hand, only 15%, 15 of online media images include people of this age. So I'm curious, beyond us really just looking to represent people that are beyond, and this maybe gets in part of the client conversation too, Angela, that you were talking about with a youth-obsessed culture, would you ever see a world where there would be stricter editorial policies in place um, around media depictions for those um, to represent a more full spectrum of our society? I think a lot of that is going to come from um, public, public shift culturally because a lot of what, um, let's face it, a lot of what businesses, brands do is reactionary to what they've been told from the ground up. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, it's not something they may necessarily want to do, but they kind of have to do. So I think if people, generally speaking, just as the public have already been outspoken about, you know, defining, you know, their sex, their gender, how you, rep how you refer to them as, um, I think that that also is just another category that needs to be shouted out and not just left to be a tokenism either. So, because tokenism is, is, is rife, right. and you see that all the time, and you can just smell it a mile away. So. I wonder if we should start putting our age in our email signatures. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's the way to start having that conversation. Well, I think, you know, the thing is, is that you can either have a symbiotic relationship, right, with brands, as um, those of us that are the general public, we are the influencers, right? We are the ones who purchase and also can demand. So it can be a beautiful symbiotic relationship or it becomes a parasitic relationship, right? Yeah. When they're trying to just eat at us and yeah. take from us and shove what they want to us. And so I think you have to really, tr you have to try to decide as a brand, as a person, and which both of those ends, how do you want to get into a symbiotic relationship so things are being built for you, you are demanding the things that you want versus just taking what they give you as they're like eating away at you. Yeah, and making you not feel great about no, yourself. No, no. Not at all. I think, oh, I was gonna say also to um, amplifying and rewarding the, the brands that are that are doing it right. Like I think Dove has been a trailblazer in this space for sure. Yes. I think Sephora has also come a long way as well in a lot of, in the beauty space. Um, I feel like there's a little bit of like a, a glamorization of aging and um, a romanticization of aging that's happening. And I think that that's a really beautiful thing to see. We definitely have a long way to go. Um, but as somebody who manages creators that are Gen X and we have people that are 50 plus on our roster and we've done campaigns with people that are 60 plus on our roster, um, they're uh, making bank. Like those creators on our roster are some of our highest paid, paid creators. We have creators in that category that are making like a million dollars a year because 
they are in demand. And, and, and there are some brands that truly prescribe to that school of thought and really wanna be um, inclusive um, when it comes to age. And um, they're actively looking for people that uh, fall into that category so that they can give them that platform and, um, and have them truly represent their brands. So. Do you feel in the world of social media that we've been able to do that a little bit more because we can be so targeted at how we send out information versus, you know, a big print campaign and do you really want to put one singular face up there like Loewe did in such a beautiful job, right, when they put Maggie Smith as the face of her latest campaign, but very few brands are willing to take that risk, it seems. Yeah, they are, and um, I still feel like it's still, it still, it feels like... Um, it's being done as a statement mm -hmm. as opposed to anything else. A standard. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah as right. opposed to a standard. That's it. It's a statement versus a standard. Yeah. Um, so I, I was really pleasantly surprised when I saw that Saint Laurent recently appointed Diana Ross as one of their ambassadors. Um, but I also think, is that just a statement they're making versus a standard? So, you know, I, I just feel like... Where is everyone else? Where is everyone How else? do we get to a norm of yeah. that kind of behavior versus every now and then? So interesting enough, there is um, what's called uh, a DEI um, maturation curve for organizations. And oftentimes it starts with, right, right, you do nothing. That's not, you're not even doing anything. You don't even know what to do. And then there's pressure. And the, out of that pressure is when you're doing stuff like that, right? You are doing things yeah. because you are pressured to do, you have to make a statement. And then eventually you move into go, oh, this can be a standard. Mm -hmm. And then you go, oh, this brings value. And then, oh, now it's partly, it's very deeply integrated into our culture. Mm -hmm. But they have to go through that curve. And I think there are brands that are trying to move from that um, statement to the standard. And we're not always forgiving. You right. know what I mean? They make one, one bad move and we're like, mm-hmm, <laughs> no. Right. right. But I think we need to allow them to kind of go through that maturation, right, curve. Yes. Yeah. Um, this has been such an incredible conversation, and I feel like we are definitely running out of time. So I don't want to wholly run out of time before I ask all of you one last question, and that is, um, I would love to know if you could go back in time <laughs> and say one thing to your younger self. What would it be? I'm going to have to start down <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have Shanae start okay. down there. I'll, I'll start. So for me, um, I would tell myself that confidence will take you further than in almost anything else in life. It will take you further than education. It will take you further than money. It is really, I believe, the belief in yourself and believe that you can accomplish, truly accomplish anything will take you further in life than any other thing can. I love that, because everyone can find confidence, right? Everyone can find that within themselves and make that decision. And the earlier you recognize and understand that, um, the further ahead you'll get sooner. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, Sinead. I think, because um, I was trying to think, I was like, what, 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 what am I going to say? Uh -huh. um, oh, no, it's gone. Oh. No, hang on. It's back. <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. Um, oh, crap. What was I going to say? I can't remember now. I forgot. Okay, you go next. You go next. Yeah, we'll it, come back it. to you. Um, so I echo what you said. Um, I think confidence is uh, very key. I would have told my younger self that as well, but I also would have told my younger self that every step that you're making is going to be okay. Yeah. Yes. 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 And don't stress. Stop stressing. It brings the lines, ladies. Stop <laughs> stressing. Whatever the mistakes are, it's okay. It is a mistake, course correct, and keep it moving. Yeah. There's a destiny out there for you. You might not have, have reached it yet. You all are, some of y'all are super young, um, but keep going. Don't, don't let the one thing define your moments. Yeah. And I said moments. Mm -hmm. 18 years old, mother. I had many moments after that, many moments. So just be confident and keep it moving. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Angela. I just remembered before I forget. Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so my one was, um, if I was talking to a younger version of myself, I would say, 
don't put any excuses in front of you to do anything you want to do. Because I think, it's, especially as women, I think we tend to put an excuse or a reason, we call it. Oh, I'm too, and insert that thing. I'm too, I'm not pretty enough. I'm not skinny enough. I'm not uh, old enough, if you're talking about someone who's younger. Um, you know, you always put a, a reason in front. Oh, I don't have, if I, oh, I want to try social media, but I don't have the latest this. I don't have the latest camera. I don't have the latest. Everyone puts reasons in front of their fear. And the biggest obstacle is yourself. Mm. And you're just using those things to justify that. So that is really what it is. Stop making excuses. Just start. You're not going to start perfectly. No one starts anything perfectly. I didn't start anything perfectly. And I bet no one on here did either. Expect to start imperfectly. And you learn as you go along. That's so beautiful. I, I'm actually gonna stop putting excuses in front of myself now. Because yeah. I think it, it, that's something for your whole life. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm thinking about this. I think two things, I know we're supposed to say one thing, but I do have two things come, come to mind. So, I had a pretty rough childhood and many of us have our own stories, but um, I talked about I was from Korea. I was adopted when I was 10 from an orphanage. So I experienced, you know, food insecurity and home insecurity, all the, all the insecurities, and then was adopted to Iowa farm community. For those of you that are international, it's not gonna make much sense, but for the US, went through the farm crisis, so our family lost our farm, went through another round of food insecurity and all of that. And so I look at the younger Kim, or Kim Fur, I'd be like, Kim Fur, you know what? You still make it. You make it, someday you're gonna be on stages like Hans and Davos, Melinda Gates Foundation and all the things because you held on. You'll make it and hold on. And what I like to um, talk with my mentees often is stop looking up. You, there's always someone ahead of you, in front of you, doing better than you because there are always more. You can look in front and up for inspiration but not as a comparison. Right, because there's also people behind you, right? I Looking at you in that way. So look at it as inspiration. I wanna be like that, not like, oh my God, I haven't made that yet. Yeah, that's at so my true. age. I love that. That's right? a very good, especially for younger people as well. Because yeah. I think you hear, how, you hear on social media that people scroll and younger people feel uglier the more they scroll. Yeah. So that I think a lot of that's to do. A friend of mine once said, which is a spin off of what you just said. Don't look right, don't look left, just look in front of you yeah. and what you've got to do. Absolutely. One of my favorite phrases is comparison is the thief of joy. Yes. Yeah. Right, yes. so yeah. I love that. Just inspiration. Inspiration. They're inspirational for you, yeah. right? Well, thank you all so much for joining this conversation today. It was such a lovely time. I don't know if we have time to throw it out. I think we're, no, we don't have any time for q and <laughs> I'm so sorry. If you have questions afterwards, I think we'll all be milling around um, and would be happy to talk with every one of you. So thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all.